This indeed is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome once again to Word Addiction. This is your host, Reverend Lawrence Makumbi from Life Pool Chapel, Kitengala, the House of Faith. And so uh, today, by God's grace, we're going to look at the book of Job uh, from chapters number 22 all through to chapters number 28. And I believe it's going to be a wonderful time in God's presence as well. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Our Lord be thy name. For indeed there is none like you. You're full of majesty. You're full of glory. You're full of goodness and mercies. Your mercies that are new each and every day. And we thank you for the fact that you've granted us a new moment, another opportunity just to read in your word. Lord, if there is no greater mercy than this, that God you've given us just the ability to sit down, and just study and hear your voice speak into our lives and our situations. Pray that Jehovah Father, somebody's life is going to be turned around today, that somebody's destiny is going to receive direction, somebody's vision is going to receive provision, and somebody's state of mind is going to be restored, Hope is going to be restored because God, you are a restorer. We give you glory and how we pray that through the person of the Holy Spirit there shall be revelation and understanding placed upon our hearts today. It is in Jesus' mighty name we do trust, praying, and believing. Amen and amen. Job chapter number 23, uh, Job, Job chapter number 22, sorry, verses 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, can a man be profitable to God? Though he who is wise may be profitable to himself. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? Eliphaz here has got a point in that, you know, it is not your righteousness that brings profit before God. It says this, that though he is wise, may be profitable to what? To himself. Can a man be profitable to God? Though he who is wise may be profitable to himself. And the same he talks about, uh, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? In other words, God has got nothing to gain with your righteousness. But you've got everything to gain when you walk uprightly before him. You know, your prayer doesn't change God. Your prayer doesn't make God gain. God existed before even we were born. But when we pray, we help ourselves and we help fellow humanity. Your fasting doesn't help God. It doesn't make God, excuse me, any greater than he is before you started fasting. Neither because your not fasting does not make God any lesser powerful than he is. When you fast, it is you that fasting helps. Because when you come before the presence of God in fasting, you're actually saying, I am humbling myself to learn. I'm humbling myself, God, to seek your face. I'm humbling myself, God, to access wisdom. You know, whatever request that you have before God, it is a state of humility. Denying yourself the pleasures of this world that you may gain what the spiritual world through God wants to deliver in your life. So Eliphaz says, do you know what? You can be wise, but I can it profit God? No, your wisdom profits you. You can be righteous, you can be blameless, but that does it make God gain? Absolutely not. Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? For you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason. And strip the naked of their clothing. Hmm. You have not given the weary water to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. But the mighty man possessed the land, and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty, and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. Therefore, snares are all around you, and sudden fear troubles you. Or darkness, so that you cannot see and an abundance of water covers, covers you. So Eliphaz is trying to tell Job, number one, uh, you know, it is, is it, uh, number one, is it not your wickedness greater 
great and your iniquity without end. And then he begins to state things that he suspects Job could have done. He says, for you have taken pledges from your brothers for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given weary water to drink and you have withheld bread from the hungry. But the mighty man possessed the land and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. Therefore, snares are all around you and sudden fear troubles you. Or darkness so that you cannot see and an abundance of water covers you. In other words, because you didn't take care of the fatherless, you sent the widows without bread. You 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 unclothed. You know. Uh, 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 you know. You took away our clothing and stripped people naked. And so these are the accusations. These are the things that Eliphaz feels that perhaps you are in this situation. You are in job because this is what you have you've done. Let us see. We'll see in chapters uh, chapters twenty three how job uh, responds to him. Is not God in the height of heaven and see the height stars, the highest stars, how lofty they are? And you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness, thick clouds over him so that he cannot see? And he walks above the circle of heaven. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away? By a flood. They say to God, Depart from us, what can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from him. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh at them. Surely our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes their remnant. Now acquaint yourself with him and be at Peace, thereby good will come to you. Underline that if it is your Bible. And I repeat, now, Job, how I beseech you, because this God you're talking about, he is not a small God. Uh, doesn't he see the highest stars below him as lofty? And yet you say that God does not know. Please, Job, acquaint yourself with him and be at peace thereby good will come to you elphaz is giving you a very nice statement and is speaking a wonder that you know job if it is just possible for you to repent that's what actually in that in, in in the in the aspect of a quintin is saying he is is trying to talk about here he says can you please agree with god because that's what confession is Confessing your sin is agreeing with God that what you've done is contrary to his, his law, is contrary to what his will is. So can you acquaint yourself? Can you agree with God concerning the matters that you've done? Acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby, when you do this job, guess what? Good will come to you. Receive please instructions from his mouth. And lay up his words in your heart. Be quick, just, uh, Job, to listen to the instructions that God gives you. And do what? And lay up his word in your heart. One good thing to happen, let the word of God find a resting place in your heart. And if you return to the Almighty, you will be built up and you will remove iniquity far from your tents. Then you will lay, lay your gold in the dust and the gold of Ephraim among the stones of the brooks. Talks about your prosperity will be brought back. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious a silver. There's a time I said, you know what? Finding God is finding gold. When you find God, you found provision. When you find God, you found wealth. Why? Doesn't the Bible tell us this? That he is the one who grants us. The ability to create wealth. All silver and gold belong to him. When you find God, you find access to his riches and his wealth. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33, and all these things shall be added unto you. 26. For then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will also then do what? Decree a thing and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways. So before you decree, repent. Before you decree, acquaint yourself with the Lord. Before you decree, heed these instructions. Before you decree, lay, lay God's word in your heart. Before you decree, make sure you have prayed. And before you decree, make sure you've paid your vows. I know most of us will have said, I decree, I declare, it shall be so. I decree, I declare, it shall be so. Are you decreeing and declaring, having acquainted yourself with God? Are you decreeing and declaring, yet there is unconfessed sin in your life? Are you decreeing and declaring because something has just happened, you're not prayerful, and you just want to see if you decree and declare, so perhaps some magic will occur. Are you decreeing and declaring, yet there are unmet vows or unpaid vows you've never paid? That's why a lot of people get frustrated. I decree, I declare, this and this shall happen. And God looks at you and says, you want me to honor the decrees of your lips, yet there are vows, you, the same lips made, and the vows were unkept, or the vows remain unpaid. Your words cannot have power. If the same words, the same mouth that, proceed, that, that no, spoke words, that were a vow. You know, you can say something like, God, I vow. I will, um, I will do what? I will win one soul every month or one soul every day. I will share your word with somebody. It's a vow that you've made before God. And God waits to see, have you paid that vow? Is that soul witnessed to? You may say, God, I vow, if I get a job, I will build your house. I will give this. I will do this. And God blesses you with a job. Did you keep that vow? Or you are like Anna, you're saying, God, grant me a son and I will give him back to you for service. Now you have gotten the son. Shall you go back at Shiloh and give the son Samuel back to God? You've said, God, if you just grant me the grace to be married, I will serve you faithfully with all my heart. Now that you're married, do you still go for night vigils as you used to go before you, get mar you got married? Are you still serving in the choir as you'd vow to serve in the choir? Are you serving, you know, uh, uh, the needy as you'd vowed you're going to serve the needy? So before you decree and declare the next breakthrough in your life, figure out the things that Job 28 from verses 21 all through to verses 30, you know, declare. So you will decree and declare a th you will decree a thing and it shall be established for you so light will shine on your ways it talks about revelation when you decree and declare god allows light to shine your way having revelation on what you're supposed to do when they cast you down and you say exaltation will come then it will save the humble person it will even deliver one who is not innocent yes he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is, li is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I will present my case before him and will fill my mouth with arguments. I will know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he content with me in his great power? No, but you'll take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I will be delivered forever, my judge. From I will be delivered forever from my judge. In other words, we shall just get an opportunity. You know, figure you know to is it figuratively or you know in such a way that I can stand before God. 
as Moses saw him face to face. Job feels, I wish. You know, God is so silent. This Francis Schaeffer who said, he is there and he is not silent. God is there. But in this moment, Job wonders, why is God so silent? I wish I could present myself before him. I wish I could see him face to face and plead my judgment to him. You know, so that he could judge me. Of course, he says this, I would know the words which you would answer me and understand what you would say. Would he content with me in his great power? No, he knows. But you'll take note of me. At least, because right now Job feels as if this calamity has befallen me. I don't know the reason why I am here. And it seems as if God does not care or does not even think that I'm going through this. Not only, not only like, you know, uh, not only does he think that God has forgotten his existence and his situation that is in that, that Job is in. Look, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When the works on the left, uh, when he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Listen to that. For he knows, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Job knew, if this is the doing of the Lord, then he is testing me. And as long as he is testing me, there is something good that will come out of the test that God has put me through. In other words, I shall be like gold. When you look at the later years of Job, as we will come at look at them, you will discover how the later years of Job were like gold. When he passed through the tests in his life, the end of the matter was so glorious and was so great. And you know, the book of Hebrews talks about God loves those that he disciplines. And the reason why God disciplines you and the reason why God, you know, tests you, he does not test you so that you may fail. God lets you pass through situations and circumstances and he uses them to refine your life and make you better. Remember Joseph? When his brothers came to him in Genesis chapter number 15 and told him, now that our dad is dead, Joseph, please, uh, our dad made us to tell you that you should not, uh, you, you should not uh, get back to us because of what we did to you. And Joseph looked at them and he said, I'm in the place of God. For what you intended for evil, God turned it for good. So Joseph saw that all the tests he went through, the hatred of his brothers, being sold to slavery after being thrown into the pit, going to Potiphar's house, having Potiphar's wife, you know, try to, uh, uh, to tempt him and, uh, and, and, and accuse him wrongly and falsely, going to prison, you know, the cup bearer forgetting him for two years. And when all has been said and done, when Joseph became the second in command in the land of Egypt, he had this attitude that whatever I have gone through, yes, I am the second in command, the most second most powerful person in Egypt after Pharaoh. But I was here and I'm seated here because through the tests that I passed through in life, God had a purpose and this was the purpose that I may sit on this seat and preserve the lives of many. So Job looks at his life and he says, do you know what? After the tests, I shall come better and I shall come out like gold or as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way, not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Can you underline that? Can you say that about yourself? Can I say this about myself? That I have treasured the words of his mouth. In other words, the word of God more than my necessary food. I remember reading the story of um, one servant of God, Smith Wigglesworth. And he'll say, you know, you always carried a pocket, a pocket Bible of the New Testament. And whenever you sat down to eat, 
you would open up the scriptures and read the scriptures even before he started feeding on his food. That's how Smith Wigglesworth, we call him the father of faith, an apostle of faith, sorry. And it is as a result of just loving God's word and you'll not understand how can you sit down to eat food and you haven't studied God's word. So for him, God's word was more important than food. That I cannot feed my spiritual, my physical man if I'm not also feeding my spiritual man. So the, the job here says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than the necessary, more than my necessary food. But he is unique and who can make him charge? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me. And many such things are with me. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness. And he did not hide deep darkness from my face. Since times are not hidden from the Almighty, why do those who know him See not his days. Some remove landmarks. They seize flocks violently and feed on them. They drive away the donkey of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. They push the needy off the road. All the poor of the land are forced to hide. Indeed, like wild donkeys in the desert, they go out to their work, searching for food. The wilderness yields food for them. And for their children, they gather their fodder in the field and glean the vineyard of the wicked. They spend the night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and add all around the rock for want of shelter. So he's saying, you know, it's like replaying what Eliphaz was trying to portray that perhaps Job has done. Remember, sending the wicked, the, the, the widow without bread, overlooking the fatherless, taking the pledges of the needy. You know, so Job is saying, I have seen these things and I've seen people do this. You know, some snatch the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge from the poor. They cause the poor to go naked without clothing and they take away the sheaves from the angry. They press out oil within their walls and trade wine presses yet. A suffer thirst. The dying groan in the city and the soul of the wounded cry out, yet God does not charge them with wrong. There's all those things, Eliphaz, you've said, I have also seen. But I've also seen that they have not gone through what I have gone through, yet I have not done those things. There are those who rebel against the light or against revelation. They do not know its ways nor abide in its paths. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy, and in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the elder trap waits for the tree light, saying, No eye will see me, and, the, and he disguises his face. In the dark they break into the houses, which they marked for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light, for the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. They should be swift on the face of the waters. Their portion should be cast in the earth. So that no one will return into the way of their vineyards. As drought and heat consume the snow waters. So the grave consumes those who have sinned. The womb should forget him. The worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more, and wickedness should be broken like a tree. For he preys on the barren who do not bear and does, and does no good for the widow. But God draws the mighty away with his power. He rises up, but no man is sure of life. He gives them security, and they rely on it. Yet his eyes are on their ways. They are exalted for a little while. Then they are gone. They are brought low. They are taken out of the way like all others. 
they they dry out like the heads of grain now is it is not so who will prove me a liar and make my speech worth nothing listen to job he says all these things we know the end of the wicked we know, you know, let the womb forget that they were ever born. Let the worm feed on them sweetly on him. That's what he says. And this is, and these are the things that happen to the wicked. These are the things that those, you know, the destiny of those who do wicked. It is known. And he says, then correct me if this, you think that I don't know this is the way of the wicked. If, you know, it's like, he wants these people to know, his friends to know, I already know that the wicked are treated the way I am, but I don't think I am wicked. The things that you are accusing me for, no, 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 no. I've even seen people do what you are accusing me for, and they are still alive. 25. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, Dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his light not rise? How then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine, and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a woman. He talks about the greatness of God, the majesty of God, and he asks, can anyone who is born of a woman be without sin? Of course, the original sin that Adam, you know, uh, you know, sin came, the Bible says that through Adam sin came, and through Christ righteousness has come. So we have been all been born to, in sin. And so Bildad is right here. And he's saying, can anyone be blameless with, before God? Cannot be blameless before God? Can anyone be pure who is born of a woman? In other words, when you became flesh, you were born into the sin of Adam. But Job answered and said, how have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared sound advice to many? To whom have you uttered words and whose spirit came from you? The dead tremble. Those under the waters and those inhabiting them, she all is naked before him. And destruction has no covering. He stretches out the north over empty spaces. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds. Yet the clouds are not broken under it. It covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters. At the boundary of light darkness, the pillars of heaven tremble and, astonishing at, and are astonished at his rebuke. He stirs up the sea with his power and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. By his spirit he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Indeed, there are mere ages on his way. And how small a whisper we hear of him by the thunder of his power who can understand. Moreover, Job continues his discord and said, As God lives who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I shall say, you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. In other words, even though you accuse me, my brothers, I shall not admit that I am wicked. I will not lay down that I have lived a righteous life just to make you feel good. I will go to the grave having not confessed that I have done wickedly. He knows how his, how his life was. He knows what he did. 
And didn't we read that God looked and he said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? A man who fears me, a man who is upright, a man who is not blameless. Until this, Satan did not say, Ah, I know, I know some sins that Job has done. But he said, Does he fear you for nothing? Does he walk uprightly for nothing? Is he blameless for nothing? Don't we know? Don't we understand? It is as a result of how you've protected him that he is loyal and upright before you. Can you just take away that protection and see if he does not curse you? That's what, this, that's what the enemy or Satan says about Job. He does not say, there is a sin I know that Job did. He does not refute that Job was a righteous man. And may my enemies be like, be like the wicked, and he who rises up against me like the, unrighteous, like, like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much if God takes away his life? Will God hear his cry? When trouble comes upon him, will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? I will teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty I will not conceal. Surely, all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty in his children are multiplied. It is for the sword. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword. And his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those who survive him shall be, sh shall be buried in death. And the widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it. The innocent will divide the silver. He builds his house like a moth, like a booth with a, with, with a watchman, which a, watch, uh, which a watchman makes. The rich, the rich man will lie down, but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes and he is no more. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest, a, a, a tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls against him and does not spare. He flees desperately from its power. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. The path of the ungodly, the path of the righteous, Job states it very well. He says, you know, we know their end. That's, that's, you know, something that Job keeps on pledging is that, that we know the end of these people. We know their end. I know. It's not that it is a strange thing to me. I know. We all know how these people end up. But I just want you to know that I am not one of them. Surely, there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is melted from ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess. For all in the darkness and the shadow of death, he breaks open a shaft away from people. In places forgotten by feet, they hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, from it comes bread, but under it, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the source of sapphires, and it contains gold dust. That path no bird knows, nor has the falcon's eye seen it. The proud lions have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint, he overturns the mountains at the roots. He cuts out channels in the rock, and his eyes sees every precious thing. He dumps up the streams from trickling what is hidden he brings forth to light. But where can wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. 
It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed, weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Neither gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The toppers of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From when then does wisdom come, and where is the place of understanding? He says in verses 21, It is hidden from the eyes of all living, and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death says, We have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its ways, and he knows its place. All the places that he has mentioned that, gold, that wisdom cannot be found. He says this, God understands its ways and he knows where its place is. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the old heavens to establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. When he made a law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolt, then he saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it, indeed, he searched it out. And no man, he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So God has wisdom, 23. God understands its ways, and he also knows his place. And so if you want to access wisdom, he says, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is if you want wisdom, fear him. That's where it's understand. It starts. Fear. Fear God. Acknowledge God. Because when you know that you are fearing God, you know, the Bible tells us what? That a fool says in his heart, there is no God. As soon as you declare there is no God, it means that I am free to do everything without any sense of accountability or guilt. But if you know there is a God and you fear him, you will be cautious and careful in regards to the actions that you do, the, 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 the words that you speak, how you handle people, how you handle yourself. Even when you are alone, when nobody is watching, be just because you fear God, there is a sense of wisdom that flows and says, you know what, I am God conscious. God is here. I know God sees I may not feel him, um, but, but I just know that God knows and know and sees what I do. That's why he says there are people who work in the darkness. Talked about the thief who don't fear light, which I said is revelation. They have no revelation. Somebody who steals doesn't have revelation. Somebody who goes to the, uh, uh, the, the elder tra, he hides himself. Say, let me go before daybreak because no one sees me. He lacks understanding and he lacks revelation. He is a fool. Why? Because he lacks the wisdom to know that God is watching. Man may not see. The wife may not understand. But there is a God in heaven who sees it. And that's wisdom. When you know that God sees and God watches, you will not behave the way the people who don't acknowledge the existence of God actually behave and to depart from evil is what is understanding praise be the name of the living god we've come again to the end of our reading and i believe it has been a blessing to you as it has been to me and so tomorrow we are kicking off from uh chapters number 29 all through to chapters number i think uh, 33 34 there and let the lord just speak to you as you read the bible in advance i pray that above all let you know Oh, that as you go through the test that you're going through, or you'll ever go through because as long as we are alive, we will go through tests and trials. But we should be of good cheer that Christ Jesus overcame, and so shall we overcome. There is the grace to know that at the end of every test, we shall come out as refined gold. May we access wisdom and understanding through fearing and acknowledging God's presence wherever you are. 
may you become God conscious in your undertaking in life. I want to believe that we shall succeed in Jesus' mighty name. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. May God watch over you and keep you in perfect peace. Thank you.